Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Popper Ponderings. As you can see, I'm in a completely different room. This is actually my room. Um, with our renovations going on at the store, kind of building ourselves a little bit better of a studio for all of our future video endeavors, I guess you could say. Uh, this week, instead of playing Popper, because I own a Mac and I can't get Magic Online on said Mac, I'm going to be talking about my f top 10 reasons to play Popper. Which you may think is, you know, why are we here? We already know the Popper's sweet. But you know what? I think you'll enjoy the list. And at the end of it all, I think we can go back and, and you guys can have your own list of what you guys think are uh, the top 10 reasons to play Popper or what your reasons in general to play Popper. But before we get started... As always, I'd like to thank my sponsor, The Manabase. Make sure you check us out online, www.themanabase.com. As well as, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this video. It does help us out a lot. And uh, without further ado, well, let's get started. We'll get right into it. And as you can see, I have the Mystical Teachings background. Because you all know how much I love Blue Black Control and maybe... Blue Black Control's on this list, let's see. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's get right into it with our number 10 reason to play Popper. Number 10 is Muldrifter. You get to play Muldrifter. There are very few, I would say zero constructed formats, where you can play Muldrifter and not be ashamed about it. Like, you can play it in Commander, but that really isn't that good. Uh... In, in Popper, it is actually one of the best mid-range threats or mid-range tools in the format. Five mana for a 2-2 flyer, comes into play, draws two cards. It is a somewhat of a clock. It's able to race fairly efficiently. It's also sometimes just the divination. The card is insane. And the fact that we get to play it in a format and not feel ashamed about it and not feel like we're really being, you know, maybe we're just playing a budget version of a deck. It is fantastic, and, and Moldrifter is a huge reason why playing Popper is awesome, because there are all sorts of decks that this guy slots into, from control to mid-range, and, you know, even some aggro decks can play this card. I think it's just overall a fantastic card in the format, and it is the only format that gets to play this sweet, sweet creature. So that moves on to number nine. Number nine is it's cost-effective. The most expensive deck in Popper probably runs you... There was a time when Delver had, you know, four copies of Days and four copies of Blue Elemental Blast when those cards weren't, were, hadn't, been reprinted in it, hadn't been reprinted in Eternal Masters yet. And that deck, you know, kind of got into the $100, $110 kind of echelon, you would say. That is an insanely huge outlier. For the most part, Popper costs about 50 bucks, and it's fantastic. You get to play numerous decks, and that's actually one of the main reasons why I started this series, Popper Ponderings, was because I knew that I could play a different deck every single week, didn't matter what the cards were, what the archetypes were, what the staples in the deck was, I could buy the deck, because on average, these Popper Ponderings decks cost me like... You know, if I don't count the cards that I already have, I spend in between, like, 2 to $3 buying these decks on Magic Online, which is insane. When you factor that in, when you look at this card right here, Tarnalwolf, sweet card I played in Modern, that card is $150. Nobody wants to spend that much, especially on a sweet format where, you know, if you have Tarnalwolf, well, it's going to feel pretty bad if you're going to a tournament and you're sleeving up a, you know, blue-red deck or a black-white deck or a black-red deck, and you're not going to be able to play this card because I spent... $600 on these four pieces of cardboard and it doesn't really even fit what I want to do right now. That just feels bad. So the fact that we get to play anything for, you know, I'm sure you could build the entire Popper cat like a catalog of Popper decks for the amount of money it would cost for a Tarmac Wolf. So that is huge. That is why it is number nine. The format is so cost effective. So coming in to number eight we have, kind of going in with cost-effectiveness, 
is the deck building restrictions. So what do I mean by deck building restrictions? Well, I have Urza's Tower up on the screen here. The reason being is that in Pauper, while you get to play with the Urza lands, you don't necessarily just get to jam Karn on turn three, or Ulamog on turn four, or Ugin on turn four, or play an Oblivion or, or Oblivion Stone to just wipe the board. You have all these powerful cards, but a lot of the times, the finishers or the main attackers or you know some of the staples in those decks, they're going to be rare, they're going to be mythic, or they're going to be uncommon, and we just don't have access to those cards. So, in Pauper, it kind of forces you to think outside the box. That can be applied anywhere. That can be applied to Standard, that can be applied to Modern, that can be applied to Legacy. But a really great example of that is in Pauper, where... You know, with Tron, instead of just defaulting to a bunch of $80 Mythics, we're going to, you know, what can we do? We can play Fangor Marauder. That card is good against Affinity, because every time an artifact dies, we gain 5 life, which kind of synergizes with our plan of just churning through our deck. Lumos Crusher is fine. If we have removal, it's not the best. We can play things like uh, Mall Splicer, 7 mana over 7 power for 3 bodies. Another very cool card. But these deck restrictions that Popper forces on you really make it so that you become a better deck builder. Because it's not like, well, let's just shirts the shirts the rares on Gatherer to try and find what we're looking for. Oh, here's the two mythic rares that are in standard of red that are four mana. Choose one, right? There's a dragon, there's a phoenix or whatever. In the, the Popper format, you're tasked with, you know, coming up with strategies and and angles of attack that really are just different than what you've done anywhere else due to the underpowered cards. And that's really, really sweet, and that really forces you as the deck builder, as the player, to really think outside the box. And that's what I really love about the Popper format. And you've seen that on Popper Ponderings time and time again, where I'm playing these cards that really don't look that good on the face of them, but when combined with this card or combined with that card or played against this specific metagame, the cards end up being, you know, quite good. So I really enjoy the deck building restrictions that the Popper format puts on you. So moving right along, this kind of ties into the deck building restrictions. But number seven is the overall weakness of the card quality. So tied right into deck building restrictions is Look at this card. This is Curse of the Pierce Heart. This is a staple in one of the best decks in the format, Burn. This card would never see play in Modern. This card would never see play in Legacy. This card would never see play in Standard. It was in Standard. It did not see play. Why would we have to play Curse of the Pierce Heart? Well, just like with deck building restrictions, we're forced into finding suitable replacements for the rare, mythic, and uncommon versions of these cards. Curse of the Pierce Heart acts as the sulfur... Sulfuric Vortex of the Burn deck. It is a constant form of pressure, just like Sulfuric Vortex is, just like Golden Guide is, just like, you know, Rakdos Cackler is, just like Jackal Pop was. Finding these niche threats, finding these niche answers is just huge. And again, because everything's powered down, that means that it opens up this entire room for all these cards. If you look at Sandra, Sandra's a really good example right now. Right now, the best deck is Terror Aetherworks Marvel. So what that means is there's this threat right here that's about this big. There's only so many cards that interact with that card. So your card pool is shrunk dramatically. With Popper, because we're playing a card like Curse of the Pierce Heart, or we're playing a card like you know all these elves that are just you know commons, well wisher, turn Temple ranger our threat pool opens up because it doesn't feel bad to play Curse of the Pierce Heart. It doesn't feel bad to play Aspire Gold. It doesn't feel bad to play, you know, Carry and Fear in almost every single Pop Pondering deck. So when the, th the threat pool opens up, the answer pool also opens up. So that not only creates this, you know, what am I going to play, what are you going to play, what am I going to play dynamic, it also opens up, like in number eight, these deck building restrictions, these deck building kind of nuances that you have to work around. And that is really, really sweet when it comes down to trying to tune your 75 to beat their 75. Because Popper, do not get it twisted, is a 75 card format. A lot of the times standard is usually like a 65 card format, sometimes even less than that, maybe even 60. 
you know, a deck like Tim Wraith or Marvel, there's a lot of decks that just don't even care. You don't even have to decide more with that deck. It's just so inherently powerful. Lowering that power level is going to open things up, and it's going to make you have to play different threats, different answers on a regular basis. And that is so crucial, and it is so great for your deck building and your card evaluation skills. In at number six, I just talked about it. We get to play, where is it? Sweet cards. It is a Brewer's Paradise. Now I talk about Carrion Fear. I don't know why this number six is so messed up. <laughs> Let me fix that a little bit, there we go. Uh, I talk about Carrion Fear because I play it all the time. Well, it just happens to go in all these sweet niche strategies. I've played Carrion Fear, and I think I've done 22-ish Popper Ponderings. I think Carrion Fear has been like six or seven decks, which is just so sweet because I really like this card. It opens up all these different avenues. If you, you know, if you want to build a, a blue tempo deck, well, you can play it. If you want to build a black-white kind of life gain attack deck, you can play it. Whatever you want to play, and it's going to be eight, seven, and six. They all kind of go together in that when you, like in... Eight, when you have to have these deck building restrictions of not able to just copy and paste and just play the best cards and Wizards built this set with these mechanics, with these mythics, put them all in the same deck, it does the job for you. When you have to lower the power level, when there's all these threats because the power level is so low that nothing is really embarrassing to play with, it means the answers have to get even bigger because you have to encompass everything. So that means there's this entire sea of options and decks and combos and interactions that you can play with that may catch somebody off guard or may be able to you know, work around something that people have never seen before. I mean, and that's happened on Pop Ponder where we've seen you know, that Goblin Storm deck that I posted last week. That deck did things that people were just not prepared for because the sea of cards and popper is just so huge. They weren't ready to interact on that level that quickly. Therefore, we were able to take advantage of it. That is something that you can say in popper that you really can't say for a lot of formats. If you look at something like modern, where you know you have your mid-range mythic decks, as I like to call them, you know, your Carbos, your Lilianas, your Thoughtseize decks. Those decks were squarely in the middle, going straight ahead. You have your combo decks that are going to try to go over top of those decks. You're going to have your burn decks that are going to try to go underneath those decks. And then there's the Tron and the big mana decks that are going to try to go over all of those decks. That's kind of your linear path. There's not really, you don't get any deviations. In Popper, you know, there may be the some sort of black-green mid-range deck, but the mid-range deck of the format is something like Elves, where it's kind of like a combo deck, kind of like a mid-range deck. There's also like Kaldotha Jeskai. So instead of just, you know, I want to play mid-range, here's this deck. I want to play combo, here's this deck. I want to play big mana, here's this deck. You can go, instead of straight, you can go around this way, you can go around this way, you can go around this way. There's just infinite ways to build these decks. And because, again, the card pool is so large, there's infinite planes to build those decks on. Maybe you're going to try a combo here where it wasn't over there. Maybe you're going to try these couple cards in this shell. You're able to do that because the card pool is so large because the cards are powered down. So six, seven, eight, all kind of bunched together into this brewer's paradise, and that's kind of where I wanted to sum it up with number six and being the former just being brutastic. As lame as that sounds. Brutastic sounds terrible. I apologize for that. <laughs> Moving on now to number five, which is maybe my favorite. No, it's definitely not my favorite. There is no Etherworks Marble in Popper. <laughs> I don't know if you've played Standard at all, but this card is terrible to play against and to play with. Think about Collecting Company, but instead of Collecting Company, you can either lose the game on the spot or win the game on the spot. Whereas Collecting Company was like, well, we either get a pretty good advantage or we don't get a pretty good advantage. This card is terrible to play against. If you've played against it, you know. If you've played with it, you know. It's no fun for anybody. This card doesn't exist in Popper, so keep playing it. It's awesome. <laughs> Number four is Spoiler Season. 
So spoiler season in Pauper is a lot different than spoiler season for everyone else. When sets get spoiled, they kind of release the big mythic planeswalker, the big mythic dragon, you know, the dual lands. These really exciting cards that mean nothing to us in Pauper. You know what we're waiting for? We're waiting for the second Friday where they dump everything. And then you get all these, you know, sometimes powered down cards like Uncommon to Common. You get these interesting sideboard cards. It's just an entirely different kind of process. And for somebody like me who, you know, I play Modern, I play Standard, and I play Popper mostly. It's awesome because I get the Mythics and the Rares the first week. And then the second week when they're releasing all their nonsense, that's all great for Popper Because my, you know, all the gears start turning. What can I do this? What can I do with that? Here's this new mechanic. What's the best common of, you know, a good example is like something like Embalm. You know, sweet. This is a mechanic, well, not really tuned for modern or standard. I could definitely see playing some amount of Embalm creatures in Popper. So you get to this whole other angle. Instead of, you know, going really, really big up here and then, you know, into this crescendo of the last Friday just releasing whatever. Now it's, oh, let's get to these sweet commons. Let's get to these sweet commons. When they reveal the mechanics, that's a huge day for Popper fans because when you see these mechanics, you get to see, you know, what are the common cards that could that we could see that could slot into decks. That happens all the time. And a huge one is rarity downshifts. Modern Masters 2017 did miles and miles of good for the Popper format. Just like the card on the screen here, Augur of Bolas, Burning Tree Emissary, Magma Jet, Thunderous Wrath, all these cards were common in that set, creating this like dynamic of all these powerful cards now getting injected into the format so you could say oh why why do you care about modern masters as a popper player none of these cards are new all the cards are cheap anyways well we essentially had six cards get released into the format it's fantastic you know and and that is what i love just the ability to in love everything and that's i guess the central topic of this top 10 list is popper allows you to just love everything about magic you know, you have your standard, which is kind of at the top, of, or I guess modern. If we're going to make a pyramid, the top of the pyramid is modern. It's just the hyper-competitive, super-tuned, efficient cards. Then we go into standard, you get a little bit more broad, and then popper is just like, bam, right across the screen. And it's just fantastic that the spoiler season essentially is never ruined. Because on the last day is when you get this influx of like 30, 40, 50, 60 cards that you get to just scour through, and usually there's going to be two or three just random cards that turn into powerhouses. Thraben Inspector, huge card out of Shadows of Renistrad, really has not defined the popper format, but has created a, a role player in a lot of decks. So that is fantastic, and spoiler season is awesome. When people say, oh, who cares about popper? Nobody cares about the spoiler season popper. Dead wrong. So now we are on to our top three. If you want to pause the video right now and you'll think some of your reasons why you play popper obviously the format is sweet obviously we love these these interactive grindy games but why do you play comment down below i would love to hear why you guys play this great format so number three on my list <coughs> is no matter where you are, no matter what tournament you're in, there's always a free win in Popper. Because whenever you get fixed up against Blue Black Control, it is an automatic win. <laughs> it is fantastic. When I sit down against my opponent, and I'm playing Popper Ponderings, and my opponent goes Urza's Tower Expedition Map Pass, my odds of winning went from like maybe 40% before the match started to like a 5%. It is not good. When my opponent, when I go turn one, you know, whatever pass, they go dismal backwater, my chances go from like a 40% up to like easy 65-70. The deck does nothing, and I love it. And all of you Blue Black Control players out there, <laughs> tell me below why Blue Black Control is good, because I've never seen it be good. If you're a watcher of Popper Ponderings, you know that it's maybe the only deck I think I have a positive record against, and some of the decks that I play should be nowhere near being able to beat a tier deck in the format. So <laughs> I thought I'd throw this one in here as a dig to all of my blue-black control player fans. I know you're out there. 
I know you love to listen to me rip on this deck, so thanks for listening, guys. That was number three. That was the fun one, you know. It's nine serious ones and then number three because blue-black control, it's just free wins. And the blue-black control players, you know, they're just so generous. They go to these tournaments just to hand people three points after three points after three points and then maybe get a draw if they get paired against each other. So good for them. <laughs> In at number two. So when people play standard and people play modern, there's kind of these, these archetypes that they like to play against or they don't like to play against. One of the archetypes that people don't really like to play against, and the wizard has, has kind of made this a, a fact, is that people don't like to play against control. Now, that is perfect and proper, because blue-black control... Oh, blue-black control is terrible. Oh, no. Blue-black control is terrible. And that's point number two, is blue-black control sucks. <laughs> Through the history of Magic, people have been on the receiving end of, you know, Bueller Blue to Blue White Control to all of these, you know, super slow, grind you out, draw a million cards, don't let you do anything, and eventually kill you with whatever creature I have in play. That's true for Standard. That was kind of true for Modern. It doesn't usually happen. It was true for Legacy in, in uh, with Miracles until they advanced Sensei's Divine Top. But it's basically been true in Standard almost its entirety. There's always been some sort of grind you out blue base control deck. Even now, you know, blue red control, right, with, with Torrential Gear Halt, that deck has, has really had a lot of fans. In Popper, we don't have that problem because the blue black control deck, even though people play it, is terrible. So it's fantastic. All these people love to play these blue black decks. And all these people can just continue to get to, to lose. And I love it because, again, every single time I play Pop Pond Rings, I want to open packs for people. And if you guys aren't aware, make sure you check out my Pop Pond Rings video. It's in the description down below. Whenever I get a match win, I get to open a pack at the end of the, of the, at the, at the, end of the videos. So whenever I play against Black Control, it's perfect. I just get to open a pack for free. It is fantastic. Sometimes we open God, sometimes we open nothing. But thanks to those generous blue-black control players, we, you know, never really get an 3 It's always just the 1-2. So thank you again to the blue-black control players out there. I appreciate you. The rest of the pauper community appreciates you. And, and just please just keep sticking it out there because we do appreciate those three points. <laughs> it's really hard. You know what? I had this entire thing written out where like I was just going to play it straight the whole way. I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> For one, number one, and I swear this is serious. Hundred percent. No more reffing on blue black control. I got the I got the background mystical teachings. I had two and three were blue black control. I swear to God, this is not blue black control. Number one is the amounts of decisions in games. Decisions matter in popper. Now, you can say the decisions matter everywhere else, and you are 100% correct. But again, going back to 6, 7, and 8 with the power down cards, with where the card level goes down, play skill has to increase. Because it, it kind of works like this. For how powerful your cards are, it really doesn't matter, right? So if you're playing, a good example would be blue-white control back uh, in Return to Ravnica Theros days. You could do whatever, you know, you could waste the removal spell here, you could be over-aggressive with a counter spell there, but if you eventually drew your Sphinx's Revelation, and Sphinx's Revelation for 7, it didn't really matter what you did turns 1 through, you know, 13. If you had 1 life, if you cast Sphinx's Revelation for 6, you went up to 7, you drew 6 cards, and then the game was probably over. It didn't really matter. An example in Modern. You can look at your hand, see your two Tron pieces and an Expedition map. There's no real decision tree there. The deck is fine, and I'm not saying that the deck is not hard to play, I'm not saying that Blue Boy Control is not hard to play, but there are just games where you go, Tron piece, Tron piece, Tron piece, play a Karn, kill your land, pass the turn, and the game just ends. There are very few spots in Popper other than, you know, the Delver flip at uh, Mana Leak, have the Ninja whatever draws, and that's really only one deck in the format where that happens, and the reason is the lower card quality. As you lower the card quality, every single decision matters because if 
we're talking about if you uh, if you guys watch the Pro Tour, you see that advantage bar. Now that was swinging side to side, side to side, due to you know cards like Ether or Marvel, where you could be in a bad spot. You play that card, you flip it. Ulog is going to get you. He's going to swing that advantage bar across the table. Ulog doesn't exist in Popper. It's all about small incremental advantages. So you know if this, if the, the advantage bar is here and it's over here as the game goes on. To get it back over to this side, it's, you know, favorable trade, favorable trade. Maybe you get a two-for-one, maybe you get a two-for-one. But you got to build those up, build those up, build those up. You eventually get there. And then depending on the situation, they could be taking your life total down. So the decision-making in Popper is just huge, again, due to the power level. So I guess in total, in this entire list or, or whatever thesis I'm trying to make here, is that the reason Popper is so sweet is again due to the lowered power level. It increases the decisions that you have to make and it increases the, I guess, importance of those decisions. It makes it so there's a larger card pool to play with. It makes it so your deck building is heavily restricted. You need to you know, find things that other people maybe haven't found. But it also allows for innovation in spots where there usually wouldn't be innovation because there would be a mythic that you would play or there would be a rare that you would play. Here, everything is a common. So as your decisions go up, your card quality goes down. As the card quality is up, the decisions are down. That's just kind of how it works. There's nothing wrong with that. And you can, you know, berate me in the comments all you want. Tell me that these Timber Mirror matches are super competitive or super complex and stuff. And I 100% agree. But there are times where you just, you know, have the Attune, have the Rogue Refiner, have the Aether Hub, play Marvel, and Uma. That happens. That doesn't happen in Popper. Every game is a slog. If you like that type of magic, then I'm sure you already have found Popper. Or if you haven't, then please check it out because this format is awesome. I love it. As much as I make fun of the Blue Black Control players, it is a blast to play. I don't think Blue Black Control is very good, but it's probably better than I'm saying it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. Please comment down below what you think your or what do you think? What are your reasons for playing Popper? Please comment down below. I would love to hear them. Uh, I'm gonna switch it back over to this. Yeah, that's better. So thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this channel as well. Make sure you check us out online www.themanoface.com. And as well, thanks for watching. And uh, next week I'll be back, hopefully, with uh, some more Popper gameplay. If not, you know what? I might have another little top 10 list for you guys. So thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you next week.